Okay, we're going to take a look at the introduction to the velocity problem. Uh, this is assuming you've already watched the introduction to the tangent problem. Uh, this is going to be a discussion of what the velocity problem is and how that relates to the tangent problem. So let's start by stating what do we mean by the velocity problem. The velocity problem is to find the instantaneous velocity of an object at a specified time. So we want to lay some groundwork before we approach this problem and see how we want to deal with it. Uh, first we need to talk about what we mean by velocity. And a lot of times people use the word speed and velocity interchangeably. They are not actually the same thing. They're close, but they're not the same thing. Uh, when we're talking about linear motion, velocity can actually be positive or negative. Uh, when you just have casual non-math conversations with people, it doesn't make any sense to have a negative uh, velocity. What we mean by a negative velocity is that your sign indicates your direction of your motion. So if we say something has a velocity of negative, let's say, 10 feet per second, what we mean is that they have a speed of 10 feet per second in a negative direction. Now negative, you define negative. Sometimes that's down, sometimes that's left. It just depends on what physical situation you're talking about. But you define a negative direction. Um, so when we talk about speed, speed is always the absolute value of velocity and it's always positive. So velocity can be positive or negative. Speed is always positive. So velocity is just speed with a directional component to it. So now that we understand what we mean by velocity, Let's talk about what we mean by instantaneous velocity. We have average velocity and we have instantaneous velocity. Average velocity occurs over a period of time, meaning in between two times, whereas instantaneous velocity occurs at one specific time. If you're talking about a car, a car travels 200 miles in four hours, then its average velocity during those four hours is 200 miles divided by four hours on average, it travels at a velocity of about 50 miles per hour. Okay? Of course, the car didn't travel 50 miles per hour the entire time. The instantaneous velocity of that car over the course of those four hours would be faster than 50 miles per hour or slower than 50 miles per hour. Um, so instantaneous velocity is what happens at a specific moment. In general, if you want to calculate the average velocity of something, uh, over a period of time, from say a time one to a time two. The way you calculate that is you look at the change in s. That triangle is the Greek letter delta. It always means change. So you look at the change in s. Traditionally we use s to represent a position. So this is a change in position with respect to a change in time. In other words, the change in position is the difference in the two positions at time one versus time two divided by the change in the two times themselves. This should look awfully familiar. Uh, if you notice, when we start seeing delta S over delta T, it starts to resemble delta Y over delta X. And that's kind of why we have these conversations about velocity problems and tangent problems at the same time. Instantaneous velocity is a little bit trickier because it occurs at only one specific time rather than over the course of at a time, so in between two times, it's not as easy to calculate at first. We're going to have to dig a little bit to figure out how to do this. Before we do it, let's take a look at this graph. As an introduction to instantaneous versus average velocity, let's look at this. Uh, what I have graphed here is time in minutes versus position in meters. So this is an object at a time of zero, it has started at a position of zero. By the time four minutes have elapsed, its position is now 20 meters away. And if you notice, that tells its position. So zero, zero, at one minute, it's five meters away, two minutes, 10, three minutes, 15, four minutes, 20. So what I'm describing to you is its position, but we're going to be able to calculate its velocity over those times. So if we talk about in between a time of zero minutes and one minute, and I want to talk about its velocity. Notice I've given you two places to look at, here at zero and at one minute. 
the average velocity would be the change in position. The pos change in position here is 5 meters over the change in time, so 1 minute. So the average velocity is 5 meters per minute for the first minute. Similarly, if you look between the first minute and the second minute, notice the change in position. It has gone from a position of 5 meters to a position of 10 meters. So the change in position here is also 5 meters over the course of 1 minute. So in every single one of these, the same thing here, between 2 minutes and 3 minutes, its position is changed by 5. Between 3 minutes and 4 minutes, its position is changed by 5. So in all of these, if we want to talk about its average velocity. Now the way we designate a lot of that is v sub a v e, average velocity. Change in position over change in time. For every one of these time intervals, it's a change of 5 meters per 1 minute. So it's 5 meters per minute. Now, the interesting thing is it doesn't matter where you're looking for this particular graph. I could have asked you the average velocity between, let's say, a position of zero and at half a minute. Well, notice it should be, because I've made this a nice constant graph, that should be halfway in between at 2.5. So the average velocity would be the same. Instantaneous velocity. The, because, again, this is a nice constant graph, the instantaneous velocity at any of these times is also 5 meters per minute. So let's take a look at another graph. Let's look at this one. I've changed up some things. Uh, if you notice, it still starts, it still has time in meters, excuse me, time in minutes. It still has position in meters. It starts at a time of zero and a position of zero and after one minute it has traveled to five meters. So notice here we actually have the same as the previous graph. The average velocity here is going to be five meters over the one minute. In addition, because for that particular piece of the graph, it's a nice constant graph, its instantaneous velocity is also going to be five meters for every one minute or five meters per minute. Now, if we look in between one minute and two minutes this time, though, we've got a change. Notice here, the change in position is no longer five meters over that one minute. It's now gone from a position of five to a position of 15. So the change in position over that time interval is now 10 meters. And that's over the course of one minute. So that's your average velocity. The instantaneous, again, because it's constant over the entire uh, time interval from one minute to two minute, is actually the same in this case. It's still going to be 10 meters per minute. Um, notice if I had asked you from one to one and a half minutes, the change in position would be five and the change in time would be one half. Well, five divided by one half is still 10. All right, so that's that piece. Let's talk about between two minutes and three minutes. Between two minutes and three minutes, at two minutes, your position is 15. At three minutes, the position is also 15. So what was the change in position for this particular time interval? Well, it turns out it's zero. So in other words, your object was not moving for that one minute. Its average velocity is zero meters per one minute. So your object's not moving here. It's also its instantaneous velocity, zero meters per minute. And then finally on the last piece here, you have a time of three to a minutes to a time of four minutes and a change in position from 15 meters to 20 meters. So it's five meters over the course of that one minute. That's your average velocity, okay? And again, because it's nice and constant, it's also your instantaneous velocity. So if you look at this without all the markings on it, what you see is that your velocity from zero to one is smaller than your velocity from one to two. 
Uh, from 2 to 3, it's flat because your velocity is 0. And from 3 to 4, uh, it's moving again, but notice it's got the same velocity as between 0 and 1. So it's going slower, faster, not moving, slower. Still moving, but slower. Keep that in mind as we take a look at the next graph. In this graph, we still have time in minutes and position in meters. You're starting at a time of zero, a position of zero, and ending at a time of four minutes and a position of 20 meters. So it has that in common with the previous two. You could also calculate average velocities, although not quite as clearly with this particular graph. Because, for example, if I look from zero to one, first of all, I'm going to have to estimate because I didn't put these on nice numbers for you. Your change in position goes from a position of 0 to, let's say, about a position of 2.5 uh, meters over the course of uh, one minute. So 2.5 meters per minute. There's a decimal there. So you can still figure out the average velocity over the course of a minute, but the instantaneous velocity here, this graph is not constant anymore. You're going to have to kind of estimate it, but if you get kind of a big picture, you can tell that your particle or your object is traveling slowly at first because it's got a small change in position relative to its change in time here, faster between one minute and two minutes, uh, it slows down a little bit up in here, and then all of a sudden it, it has very little movement to it whatsoever. So what we have is slow, faster, 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 oh, starting to slow down, slow down, slow down, and again leveling off to almost stopping. Notice how I'm able to have a discussion about the instantaneous velocity even though it's not constant for this graph. Now, once you've got an eye on that, watch this. If we look at the tangent lines to this curve, notice how you have the slope of a tangent line here. It's positive. The slope of the tangent line here is also positive. But which one of those tangent lines has a larger slope? Well, it's definitely this one, because the steeper that line is, the larger your slope is going to be. So this one has a positive slope, but this but this one is larger and positive. And then as you look at other tangent lines, notice here the tangent line is starting to level off. That, that tangent line is actually getting very close to horizontal. And what is the slope of a horizontal line? Well, it's zero. So that's how you can relate the tangent problem to the velocity problem. We have positive slope, but small-ish, positive slope larger, positive slope, but definitely getting close to zero. So it turns out instantaneous velocity and slope of the tangent line are pretty much the same thing. It's just a difference in how you define your function. So let's take a look at a specific example. A stone is dropped from the top of a building 600 meters tall and falls to the earth. Estimate the instantaneous velocity at t equals 5 seconds. We're going to use Galileo's formula that says the distance traveled by that stone after t seconds is given by s of t equals 4.9 times t squared. So a couple of things. This formula is only good if you're actually just dropping an object from a certain height. If you are launching it um, into the air in any way, your formula will definitely change. So this formula is specific to these kinds of situations. And we are looking to estimate the instantaneous velocity here. Okay, so this is specifically at five seconds, not between two times, but at one specific time. So we can go about this a couple of different ways. Uh, usually what we want to do, if we want to find instantaneous velocity, is go back to what we know how to do, which is to calculate average velocity we can then estimate the instantaneous velocity by finding average velocity around that indicated time. Okay. So in other words, 
I need two times to work with. Since I'm looking for the instantaneous velocity, specifically at t equals 5 seconds, what I'm going to do is pick some times close to 5 seconds and calculate the average velocities. We're going to look at the average velocity over the following time intervals. Let's look from 5 seconds to 6 seconds, from 5 seconds to 5.5 seconds, then from 5 to 5.1, and then from 5 to 5.01. And if you notice, what I'm doing is I'm shortening that time interval. 5 to 6, that's 1 second time interval, a half a second, 0.1 seconds, 0.01 seconds. So I'm shortening up those intervals. Remember, average velocity is change in position over change in time, where that's S of T sub 2 minus S of T sub 1 divided by T sub 2 minus T sub 1. And from the previous slide, our s of t is 4.9 t squared. Again, that's specific to dropping an object off of a height. All right, so if we look from 5 seconds to 6 seconds, here's our average velocity. This is s of t position at the second time. So position at time 6 is 4.9 times 6 squared. This is your position at time 6. We're looking to subtract from that your position at time 5 seconds, so 4.9 times 5 squared. So this one is position at 5 seconds. Here's your difference in your positions divided by your difference in your times, 6 seconds minus 5 seconds. When you do the calculations on this, what you come up with is 53.9 meters per second. So that's from 5 to 6. Let's shorten up our time interval and look from 5 seconds to 5 and a half seconds. Here's our position at five and a half seconds versus our position at five seconds. And then there's our difference in times. Do the calculations. We come up with 51.45 meters per second. So the average velocity over one full second is 53.9 meters per second. If you shorten up the interval and make it half a second long, your average velocity is now 51.45 meters per second. If you shorten it up even more, look at it at point 0.1. Position at 5.1, position at 5, minus the difference in the, divided by the difference in the times, you get 49.49 meters per second. And if you shorten it up even farther, so that your time interval lasts only 0.01 seconds, here are your positions, here are your times, what you get is 49.049 meters per second. And if you're paying attention, what you're starting to see is the smaller I make the time interval, these seem to be getting very, very close to one specific number, namely 49 meters per second. So we are going to estimate that the instantaneous velocity at 5 seconds, at t equals 5, will be 49 meters per second. Okay, So it's an educated guess. It is a good guess, but most importantly, it's a guess. Okay. Uh, the same problem we ran into with the tangent problem is what we're going to run into with this one. These are just estimates. Not only that, these numerical calculations get very tedious. This was a nice function. Uh, the s of t equals 4.9 uh, t squared is one of the nicer functions you can work with. They can get much more complicated. So, the good news is we have an excellent estimate. The bad news is it's just an estimate and it took us a long time to get there. But we've answered our question. We have a guess as to what the instantaneous velocity is. So, just to take it a step further and kind of show you where we're heading with this idea, what if instead of doing these same calculations over and over again, we instead do it one time with a generalized number. And here's what I mean by that. Look back at the algebra from the previous slide. Look at this. See the repetition? Here's the 122.5, 122.5. I'm doing this 4.9 times 5 squared in every single calculation. And notice in every single denominator, I'm subtracting 5. So mathematicians, being inherently lazy people, uh, when we have to do these calculations over and over again, we'd rather just do it once with a generalized number. So let's let h 
B, the amount of time beyond five seconds that this stone has traveled. We picked five because that's where we're aiming to find the instantaneous velocity. So for example, if you're looking at that time interval from five to six seconds, H is the amount of time beyond five seconds. So H would be one. As opposed to if you're looking at the time interval from five to 5.1, H would be 0 0.01. Okay. So in that case, again, we have our chain average velocity would be change in position divided by change in time. So now we have S of 5 plus H. This is your position when you are beyond 5 seconds by H minus your position at 5 seconds divided by, here's your time beyond 5 seconds, minus 5 seconds. Okay. So let's take a look at that. And remember, our S of t is 4.9 times t squared. Okay, So what we get is uh, 4.9 times, instead of 5 plus, excuse me, instead of t, we put in 5 plus h. So we get 5 plus h squared minus s of 5. So instead of t, we put in 5. There's that 4.9 times 5 squared again, divided by 5 plus h minus 5. And of course, what happens to those 5s? They cancel, and you just get h. So I'm going to do some algebra at this point. I'm going to, you cannot distribute that 4.9 in until after you square the 5 plus h. So we've got 4.9, square your 5 plus h. Keep in mind that's a FOIL. There will be a middle term to that. That's 25 plus 10h plus h squared minus 25 times 4.9 is 122.5 divided by h. Distribute the 4.9 in, we get 122.5 plus 4.9 times 10 is 49h plus 4.9h squared minus 122.5 all over h. And notice some nice things start to happen. Those, we have a positive 122.5 and a negative 122.5. Notice the only terms we have left in the numerator have an h in common. So I'm going to be able to factor that out so that I get 49 plus 4.9h divided by h. And of course, those h's are nicely going to cancel. So what I end up with is 49 plus 4.9 times h when I'm done with the algebra on this one. So we've got the average velocity for this example, it's only for this example, is 49 plus 4.9 times h. Why did we go about doing this? What kind of help did that give us? A couple of things. One, the numerical calculations are now simplified. Uh, for example, if I wanted to redo that average velocity from 5 to 5.1, now all I have to do is identify the fact that h, which is the distance, is which is the time beyond 5 seconds, is just 0.1. Well then just plug in 0.1 in for my h. You take 49 plus 4.9 times 0.1, and there you go. You get the same number that we got earlier. So that calculation is definitely much easier um, once you've already done all the algebra, but that's actually not why this is better. The instantaneous velocity is not a guess anymore. Because what does h equal at exactly 5 seconds? Remember, instantaneous velocity is not between two times, it's exactly at 5 seconds. So h, which is how far you've gone beyond 5 seconds, if you're at 5 seconds, that means that h should be equal to 0. You haven't gone beyond 5 seconds at all. Well, notice what that says. So then your instantaneous velocity at 5 seconds should be 49 plus 4.9 times your h, which is 0. In other words, it's 49 meters per second is your instantaneous velocity. That's not a guess. That's not an estimate. It's an exact value. So that's why this is where we're going to be aiming with these, is to get away from these estimations and guesses and a little bit towards exact values. We're going to have to lay some other groundwork first, but that's where we're heading.